Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We got Will here today. We do have one pre-submitted question. Grab that here. Ah, from Mr. Bug. Let me allow you to speak. Hey, man. Hello, sir. How you doing? I'm good. How are you, man? Good. Um, so yeah, you see the question. I, I was trying mm -hmm. to, um, I, it, the CSV to object or list mapping doesn't matter that much. Cause I, I think I, I tried it a bunch of different ways, but I've, I've got a, a simple complex object, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, um, you know, it's a list of, you, you just call it, um, case number and case name. Okay. Right. Like, sure, let, sure. let's keep it simple. Um, and then when I try to do index of, I, I want to do index of one, you know, get the index off of one field. Okay. Right. I, I just, I, I don't know. I can't make it work. Let's see. Here. Why. Let me just fetch accounts. Yep. And then you're using index of item. Yep. And list. So index of item and list. Uh, ultimately, I'm trying to look up case name from a case number i i'm not actually doing it. it's actually a court number and a, the name of the court which comes from an outside source but okay same idea let's see here so change my list type to account yeah pass in my list right and then item defined okay i'd select property i'll use email address case and sense and then up here item defined should switch to a string let me save come back item defined is still an account but you should be able to that sounds wrong key property name is email address so here i would have to do constant this feels wrong I was thinking that that was going to switch. Okay. Let me try to find this. Index item at key property. I don't you have input. index. Are you using the index of item and list step? It looks totally different from index item three. Did it actually an item to find to wait, hold on. Okay. Let's see here. Well, there should be. The step you're, you're using a different step. This is a three would actually be what four administrator accounts. So there it, it be, found the account for me. Yeah, I'm using zero, the step starts you, with zero. Yeah, index of item in list is the step I'm using here. Step information, index of item in list. Go, go to the inputs again. Mm -hmm. What's this use property? You don't have that. No. Let's see what version uh, I'm on. Oh wait, now I see it. So ah uh, interesting. No, I have it. I I didn't see that. <laughs> Nor is it in the documentation. Documentation just has a simple string list. Oh really? On the step yeah. library? So go back go back to what you said. Yeah. And so then item defined, you just did. Yeah, this, did you feels, build this data? feels weird. I don't think you should have to do this. But what I did is I set a constant. But you could use build data. You That's should be able what to I build did. Data as well. Build data. I'll select the properties I care about, which would be just email address here. Right. Oh, my gosh. All right. That worked. So I, I didn't do key property. Mm -hmm. That was my problem. So go go on to just check out the. For sure. Yeah, it seems to operate the same. If you do build data, but take off the key property, it won't work. Like I don't understand what mm. that use property thing is. If you go to the go to the documentation, okay. you'll see what I'm talking about.
Mm -hmm. Let's type. It doesn't tell you any of that. Yeah, for sure. And it only shows you a simple. I dicked around with this for an hour and finally I just set up a data structure, database structure. (laughs) (laughs) And did a look up that way, but that's not as efficient. All right, I'm, I'm I'm just here to watch from here on out. Thanks, man. Okay, you bet. Use property. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Who else has got questions? Let's start. That exhausts our pre-submitted questions for today. So as always, you can use raise hand, ask in chat, ask in QA, whichever is convenient. All right, Manal, what do you got? Hello, Will. Can you hear hey. me okay? Yep. Hey. I'm just trying to like import data in an Excel form into decisions. And I was trying to use, it's just a regular database. Like I already have a data structure set up and then we are importing data from like a SQL site. And I'm, I'm just having a confusion like how do you do it so I went up in documentation and I looked at up where there's an option of create edit data into your Mm -hmm. data structure and you can import it right so how like does it work do I just copy like so I I download the copy of the Mm -hmm. example they give it to us the excel and I have each field but not all the fields are in the excel like how does it take it like what are the requirements for me to go through the exception because whenever I do it, it just throws an exception on me. Let's see here. Let's try with the database structure here. We'll call this import data test and we'll give it two fields, str1 and str2. Mm-hmm. And then let's go, we'll come here and do import export data and we'll do uh, m export data to CSV or import data from CSV. And then here, you want to select all, right? And then we'll download existing entities, or excuse me, we'll click continue. Sorry, I have download sample, right? We we'll click download sample. There's our CSV file. Let me uh, open that up in Google Sheets really quick. And there's also one thing, I'm not sure if it's just with 8.12, but whenever I do select all with my fields, it just never works. So I'm not sure if that's just a bug or since I have over like 60 fields in the data structure, it doesn't let you do select all. Like for example- It should. Yeah, I'm on 8.12.1.7. See if this is going to play nice today. All right, so here's I'm creating uh, this. They gave me this, so I'm going to. It came with some default data in rows two and three. I deleted that. What I'm going to do is leave ID blank and then put in just some strings here and download as a CSV. Come back here. So let's upload our file. and import okay did that do anything let's create a report and let's see so we'll create a report of that simple database structure import data test and we'll add in our okay that appeared to work for me though it'd be nice for it to give you some kind of um view of it having worked so did you, the, the, the biggest error would be to have modified any of the column names in any way, added mm-hmm. new columns or anything. Um, the column names have to match exactly to the property names for this particular action to work. Okay, gotcha. Thing. 
And what if you have empty fields, for example, like in string one, you don't put anything like hello is empty. Would that work? Let's see. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Let's try. All right, downloaded a new one. We'll come here again. We'll save. And import export data. And we'll import data. Oh, actually, we can just click continue. Oh, no, Ryan, I'll click select all. I'll continue. And I will upload a file. Here's my new file. I'll import data. Come, I'll run my report. And yes, at least for a string. Now, there might be scenarios where the types are, where the types matter here, mm -hmm. right? Like maybe dates that are null or integers that are null, things like that. But it handles a string at least. Gotcha. But like, for example, you put it in a new Excel and then there's no way to like delete the old data. So for example, if I don't want the one, two, and I want a completely fresh new Excel into it, mm -hmm. will I have to like run a query to delete everything from the data structure? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You'd have to kind of handle that like kind of a little manually where you would um like run like a flow right or run a delete query or something in the query editor or a truncate or something to clean that data up but i guess if you i think you can do create edit mm -hmm. this will show me all of them can i remove a row i can't i can't actually delete a row from here which is unfortunate yeah because if i want just to delete the data that is been exported, imported from Excel. I don't want to delete my other any old data. Mm -hmm. You only want to delete the stuff that was imported from the Excel previously? Um, yes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for example, if I made changes and I wanted to add a new Excel, I don't want to see the old values. This but is I for still... the whole table though. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not, it doesn't, the table doesn't have any concept of like where the data came from. Mm -hmm. So there's no way for it to um, to tell you or to, for you to select just those records unless there's some kind of property that your um, uh, that you're adding that you know you, you you'd have to kind of identify those rows in some way based on the data that you were importing. I don't know how you might do that. But like, yeah, this is just going to show you the whole cut, the whole tables worth of data. Mm -hmm. So you have you have data that's there, and then you have data else additional data that you're importing into the table. Yes. Yeah, so for example, so what I'm doing is I already have like an application decisions, and I submit the request from decisions and all that. But I have some old data from Excel that I'm bringing into decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's the one. So like, what if I do the so it's kind of like a one-shot thing because if I do one import, then it has to be completely correct since I cannot just go ahead and delete only the data that I imported in, if that kind of makes sense. Mm, I see. So you, this is more about how can you get yourself, like you might, I mean, what one thing you could do, I mean, you could take a backup of the table or mm -hmm. you could get the tape, you could get like an insert, you could get like a, um, generate the table as like a SQL insert steps so that you can you know you could have a way to sort of revert that table back to its previous state if you needed to right so like you could do your import and then work through any of the data cleanliness issues that you have and if you needed to just truncate that table and then just run the SQL statement again to to write all your old, old records back in okay Gotcha, because I ran a SQL query and it deleted everything to delete all. Well, I mean, if you wrote a delete all query, that that, that definitely would happen, <laughs> yes. right? Mm -hmm. But like in SQL, like your DBAs could give you like a backup of a particular table as mm -hmm. like a as like a query that you could then rerun if you needed to fill it back in after for some reason, like before you started your data import. Gotcha. That makes sense. And one last thing about this, um, Will, is so whenever we get this data imported, I have the data imported, but I don't have any, like, I would not have any user actions since it's just the data. How would I right. use data user actions on these? Like, if I want to edit these. 
from decisions. You're going to want to like, so what's the data type? Is it in decisions that you're importing to? Adjust the flow execution extension data structure. Well, then you can, I mean, you could just add actions to your, um, uh, you can add like a custom edit action to the configuration folder for your flow execution extension, right? Just a normal entity mm -hmm. action. Okay. Okay. And then that will work exactly the same, just like it works for all the other records that were created into decisions. Yeah, I guess the question is, so that's kind of a comp, you're actually trying to create, the problem there is you're creating three different, we actually give you import export data on a flow execution extension. We, that we give you that option. We shouldn't if we do. We do though, because I am I can see like when I right click and I do import export data, I can see import data from CSV. Yeah, there's no way that this actually works right, unfortunately. There's too many tables here. This is more of like a simple thing. Um, just bear with me just a moment. Mm -hmm. Um, that action definitely won't work for flow execution extension data. Like um, the difficulty there is like the simple database structure data here. This is a single table. Mm -hmm. Flow execution extension data has three tables that support it. So you would be you would need to build like a custom import flow that would loop through like a setup process folder step and launch a flow if you need to actually create proper, quote unquote, proper flow execution extension data from a data import. It'd be a bit more involved than this. You can't just bring, you know, like, cause right now there's like, you have a, you have the folder table, you have mm -hmm. the flow tracking folder table, and then you have your custom table. That's only gonna give you the properties. I think back to one of your original points was it doesn't show you all the properties, right? Um, like it probably doesn't even give you folder name. I'm sure, I'm, I'm sure that it, doesn't show you folder name. And so you're only going to create one of the three supporting data structures mm -hmm. if you use this action, and which means it's probably not useful for you at all. And I think that's just because we have shown that import data action on all types, irrespective of if that particular type can support that action. Gotcha. So even if I use, so for example, if I go into the flow execution data structure and I go ahead and import it successfully, it will show the fields, but I can't do any actions on them because, or you, are you just saying that it won't even work by adding the data into it? Like it will, like if you had a report of your flow execution extension data, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It will not show these records because it's trying to do joins in the back end. And it mm -hmm. won't have records in in the other tables to show it. And so you would just be wondering why your default reports don't show this information. Like you would see it in the query editor, you would see the data in the table, mm -hmm. right? But you wouldn't see that if you started writing joins between like it and entity in like the entity folder table, you wouldn't see the entity folder data table because the import data action, it doesn't mm -hmm. actually create all the table relationships needed. It's It's more of a, it's more of a quick action for simple types like database structures and entities um, um, to do a data import than it is a action that can import data to any data type. So I think what you'd have to do is loop over your Excel mm -hmm. file and create actual, like use a setup process folder step and create actual um, data. 
culture. But if I do that with a simple data structure, that would work. Um, yeah, well, yes, you could correct. A simple data structure would let you import data in this way. But I mean, it, they're just, they're different. It's hard to know the use case here, right? But mm -hmm. like, it's, it doesn't have the same functionality as a flow execution extension if you're making like, you know, approvals and things. Like if you're just trying to create a simple data struct, like database table mm -hmm. that holds data, then yeah, you absolutely, well, you wouldn't want to use a flow execution extension for that at all. You would want to use like a simple database structure or something. And in which case, yes, you could use this action. Gotcha. And is there like anywhere any example where they have done it with flow execution data structure in the documentation? Um, like creating it from um, like the import from a CSV file, mm -hmm. or sure. even like a regular Excel or anywhere. Because mm -hmm. I tried to search it and I can't find anything. Is there like a user assignments and an async subflow? This is similar here. This one, yeah, like you basically replace the form with like a CSV. You'd need to like use like a for each Excel CSV step uh, and then like an async subflow um, uh, and, and then a loop probably. What if I search for CSV? Importing accounts via CSV. CSV to account data. So here's an example of creating data from a CSV. You'd probably want to chain these two documents together to give you some idea about what to do there. But you'd probably need to launch an async subflow with a setup process folder step and whatever other downstream processes you need. Um, this would allow you. This would let you go through each row and fire off some some steps. Gotcha. I don't think we have a perfect example of of doing that though. Moving decision modules. Uh, should be removed. Yeah. Any anything else I can help with that? Um, I think one last thing was it with like does decisions allow to add attachments? Like, can we import outside attachments into decisions? Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. You just have to build flows to do all this stuff, though. Okay, it's so just similar to something with this, like from the CSV, for example, it had like stuff with Oracle and they had like attachments, a path, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to bring attachments into decisions on like then, certain records. Mm -hmm. then, then yeah, like you could, like you can add files to folders here, I think, right? Add file reference to, to current, uh, don't, no, don't okay. use that one. Okay. No, sorry, that's a bad one. Um, here, add file references to folder. Like if you are, after you run a setup process folder step, you could then get file, you could then uh, upload files or um, or add file here. Uh, that one, that just takes in, yeah, this probably adds it to the current folder as well. Yes, you can, it, the question is just where the, where the files and the attachments come from. So for but the yes. certain records, can I go ahead and do that? For example, if I'm like, oh, for Christopher, Kristen, I need these files to be imported in their record. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for I sure. Just, mm -hmm. If you can get access to those files somewhere, then yes, you can add them as file references or even documents in the process folder so that they show up in the activity view. And then you just use the add file reference to folder and then I just use their, so I go into the full execution data data and then get their file uh, folder ID. Mm -hmm. Right, this step might be easier if you're just getting the byte data Mm -hmm. And this one is you'd have to con this assumes it's a file reference already. Um, file. But yeah, like add this just generic add file step. I think if it's in a this is in a flow with a process folder, it reads the process folder ID automatically. Okay. Gotcha. That makes sense. Awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, you bet. All right. Any other questions, please let me know. I don't see any other hands up uh, or questions in the queue currently. My hey, go ahead, Chris. Up. Yeah, go ahead. Um, best practice question. Um, 
it, your answer is probably going to be it depends, and, and it does. It's it just the trade offs between, um, let's say I, I've got um, a, a database structure for a record of some sort, and it's just got a ton of attributes. Okay. And and sometimes it's really nice to use a simple data structure. You know, so those attributes may be of type list um, or a type string, type integer, type decimal. Okay. Sometimes I want it to be of type um, person, mm -hmm. right? Because it's more convenient, I guess, than a purely flat database structure. I call mm -hmm. it flat, right? Where you have, sure. okay, name, gender, blah, blah, blah. Right. Now it causes problems with reporting, obviously. And so like one way to do that is you could click on the report, a form could come up and then could show you the, that detail. Okay. But yep. obviously I can't get that detail to show up in the report. Um, so just like, you know, what are some trade-offs there? I mean, have I already described the trade-offs, you know, convenience of, you know, creating the structure versus the reportability of it? Mm -hmm. What are some best practices and trade-offs in there? I, you know, we should be thinking through. These are all one-to-one -one relationships. Um, no, sometimes it's a list. Like you could have, uh, let's say you had a, a case record. Uh -huh. Um, you could have multiple attorneys on that case. Mm -hmm. Right. So that would be a many to one, I guess. Yeah, I think. So, I mean, I mean, but true. I don't want to build databases for all those different things. Right. So it, it, that sort of gets away from, does it, I'm not sure it matters mm -hmm. since the idea is I'm just building data structures, not databases for each of those complex mm -hmm. objects. Right. I think the big thing you lose is when you do have a list of things, right? Like if you have a list of things on a type that's not from another table, then you do lose you know, we're going to serialize that in the database yeah. for you, right? And so it makes, usually you don't realize the enhancements you need to some <laughs> of the reporting until well down the road when someone's yeah. like, hey, can you can you give me a view of, you know, I need to see every open case by attorney, right? Now you're like, okay, well, shoot, like, how am I going to do that? I'm just saving attorneys yeah. off as, as, you know, string properties or whatever, like in uh in this other thing um for ease of sort of use um so when if you do just if you do string lists that's why we throw that validation warning about serialized data it, yeah. it becomes unusable from a sql perspective if you need different you know as you sort of stumble across yeah. like more complicated reporting needs in the future yeah um i mean i guess you can still report on it you just have to do it using a flow to and build a new data database, right? I mean, database structure. Yeah, what we would see people do is start using parent-child reports, I think, to show the dependent data. In but some then way. you'd have to have those two things as separate database structures. That's true, right? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I think I, I think you. It sounds like there's no magic bullet. There's a bunch of trades. Mm -hmm. Is it a bad practice to? Is, is there a reason it's a bad practice, you know, that's going to, uh, other than the reporting aspect of having objects that are represented by a data, you know, a simple data structure in a database structure? No, I mean, in fact, you don't really gain anything besides the, I guess, the comfort of mind not knowing you don't, that you just have all these other database tables. Because even if you save it as a list in a pro in a data type, it's it's still not easily showable in the report engine today. Like it doesn't just give you all that data in some easy to consume way that I'm aware of, right? It doesn't uh, like like say you have like a string list called attorney names, right? Or attorneys, right? It's still not useful in the report engine today. Like, I like VT just put an idea in there. I like that one. Mm hmm. Sure. Created data, I, JSON data structure. Yeah, I probably still has. I mean, less probably easier, uh, less uh, un less sort of unable to be used in SQL, but still not ideal. I mean, what is it you're saving yourself from? Not 
having <sighs> database tables not not having general. not not having you know having 15 fields on the the database structure rather than like you know some of which can't be read mm-hmm. right in a s- simple manner versus 30 mm-hmm. just manageability that's mm-hmm. all your that, that's probably the only thing i'm gaining and it's probably not worth it i see it's nothing more like like you know i had to create a data structure of a um like a a a a, a loan um it called a loan application loan mm-hmm. estimate like you know it just you know you just end up with these gigantic difficult to manage data structures that's all and it just that's slows it. everything else down right like from a mapping example, yeah right? from mapping right. and everything else it just it just slows you down in development mm-hmm. um that's it yeah i mean I, that is true some things get a little bit harder to to deal with um with the more properties but you yeah. you you lose more in the long term i think yeah. for a short-term gain yeah so my best practice would be to not err on the side of design time efficiency, but in terms of keeping your options open for yeah. unexpected requirements coming in the future. And just do a, a flat a flat data structure. Okay, cool. Okay. All right. We, I, I missed a pre-submitted question here uh, from Selaja about pause versus delay. So which is the preferred step to pause a flow? Uh, and resume execution. And I would say um, likely pause flow step is going to be the uh, the right step to use here. You really, except in some very strange scenarios, you shouldn't really be using a delay. I mean, the question I would really want to know is why do you need to pause the flow at all? Like what's the design, what's the user requirement that is forcing you to um, pause the flow? But if you do have a requirement to pause a flow, um, that's not something like in the single second range, like you want to pause a flow for some period of time, um, then pause flow or uh, it might work. But likely, you know, you're probably, you could also be looking at wait on external system step here as well, depending on what you need. You know, uh, if you're waiting for an, an arrest call, oh, I see that you came off mute. Are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Can we talk a little about the user requirement? Yeah, requirement was basically, say, when an entity is in a locked state and we have to wait a certain time period before proceeding on it, what's the best way to go about it? Okay, so you're like trying to, this is sort of like a a delay delay type function? You want to like- Yeah, we just want to, retry the flow after a certain um, period of wait time and then see if we can um, get an access to the um, entity that, yeah, basically it it comes down to if we needed uh, two users need Mm -hmm. to access the same thing, then one has to wait kind of deal basically. And are you using the object lock service for this type of locking? Yeah, I believe so. Yes. I see. I think there is a. Uh, isn't there a locked until? In that case, so if you're if you're trying something and it's locked and you want to force an automatic retry. Mm-hmm. Um, now, these might this one does delay may change the user context. Um, it also holds on to it. It also puts a thread to sleep. And if you're under, if you if you're doing things at volume, that can be problematic. Okay. Um, we have some customers who are using uh, pause flow to do something similar. Okay. Um, you can't necessarily control exactly when pause flow step comes back online. Oh, I thought that uh, you can. Set a timer on there. Um, if you see resume, then if I say like, "Hey, wake up in five minutes," can I not do that? Like, uh, 
Can you uh, you, yeah, you can just not to the second. But um, I don't know that that's like, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, like, is a user it's like trying to right click on something and mm -hmm. then see if it loads? Mm -hmm. I don't know that I would. And then I, I don't know that I would put. I don't think you're gonna. You can't. I don't think you're gonna get that. Like the the context of the flow changes. So you would. I. I don't know. I guess you would have to try to use pause flow there because I think delay is gonna try to effectively make it kind of like a system context or like a back end processing flow. So you could uh, try in, pause in this flow. case. Uh, <clears throat> basically, the situation is we have a background process running and changing things mm -hmm. um, and if say a user is accessing that particular entity then the background process has to wait a certain mm -hmm. period and try again kind of thing mm -hmm. so uh, that's where we're uh, we have our it, trouble that, figuring out is the is there a scheduled job that's running it um, it's uh, like a, it's receiving a message notification and when I get a message to the it's a uh, messaging based. Okay. So if you you pull a message off of a queue and then you're trying to update an object, mm -hmm. right? And so right. in what you, okay. And so if the object is locked, you want to, you want to, you want to wait and then try again. Exactly. Yeah. I don't think you, you don't want to, cause you're going to, my advice would be to, quickly if you if if you try to touch a object that object is locked i would write the id of that object or something into a table mm -hmm. and then let the message handler end and then i would have a scheduled job pick that up and try it again till it can update it at which point it then deletes the record or something like that i think you'd find Delay step will cause your queue to not process because it will it, the message handler is going to sit there and go to sleep, right? And pause hmm. flow probably won't allow you to run either because it's an asynchronous type flow. You can't just pause the message handler execution. So you're talking about pushing some work into like a background process. Okay, our message handler is handing off the message to an async process, which is trying to update the would it still be a problem? Mm, maybe not then. Um, maybe not. Then. No, if you're already in asynchronous uh, state, then that avoids that concern. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking because it's already an asynchronous system job. Um, would pause flow cause any issues or not? Kind of thing. No, the difficulty is you lose visibility into like all the things that are queued up waiting. Like okay. there's no easy way to see that. Whereas if you wrote the if you wrote that rec request to like a temporary data store database table mm -hmm. and have a scheduled job pick it up to work it, then you'd be able to do some ad reporting and, and look at that queue. If you just have a bunch of flows that happen to have pause flow steps in them, mm -hmm. it's very difficult for you to figure out how how deep is the retry my object lock queue again list like okay. it it just becomes very difficult to use flows in a queue to have those sort of the flows queued up um i mean what you could do is something like you know you could serialize the the object that you're getting from your queue into a string you could save it into a database table you could read that you could read that record in, you could deserialize it and then process and attempt to process your message again. And then you could just put that on like a, on a high frequent, like a, a scheduled job that runs at a high frequency. Okay. Um, that's going to be better. I think that's a better pattern to try to use here than it is to try to just get individual flow executions to, to sleep themselves and restart. You won't have any, any way to tell if they were successful or if they uh, if they failed, 
if they did not resume, you lose a lot of visibility there if you try to do that in the logic of the flow itself. Okay. Um, where would you recommend using this pause flow though then? I mean, honestly, okay. not very many places. Like you really shouldn't need to actually just pause. The, I mean, we we do see people try, use it to do like retries mm -hmm. they, where they might hit a database or an API and it mm -hmm. fails and they want to retry once or twice. Um, so they would use, in that scenario, they do use pause flow for that normally um, mm -hmm. where they would put like a counter. Mm -hmm. So to sort of design some kind of counter logic. I wonder if, if we have a, an example of that in here. Will yeah, doesn't one of this doesn't one of those switch it to a system context? Yeah, I think I, they and both one might. Of them, I, think I think one of them may keep it user. If if I if that's true, I'd guess pause keeps it as user and delay doesn't. And so, but I'm so not that, certain. That can end up being important if you have follow on forms or something like that. Right. Yeah. I think in this example, it sounds like we're talking about like a background message queue architecture that's just processing messages. So I'm assuming there's no user interface here. That's correct. Um, yeah, it might feel like more. Uh, so delay step is can have very substantial, like, um, like for example, delay like to delay sleeps a thread so it's not available till it's till it's finished or resumed and you've got pro messages processing so say you process um a hmm. hundred of these of these sleeps right because mm -hmm. of the object locks you've now got a hundred you've got all these threads that you've just put to sleep that the system can't make use of so for that example pause flow is much superior um uh to delay here um, because it doesn't, uh, it actually uses decisions back in to sort of, to sort of initialize, it like kind of releases the thread and then uses our back in to re, to attempt to restart at a, at a future time. Um, so if you had to choose between these two, I would say pause flow is the better one to choose, but I would still say that you're probably better off letting a, the scheduled job service manage these retries and creating a temporary data storage to to track these things. You'll you'll have substantially better visibility in, in that sort of pattern than you will trying to figure out what flow is paused where and on what record. Okay. Yeah, we did put in a. We are thinking of doing a, a morning job that basically pulls off anything that's unprocessed due to retry failing as well and whatnot. But we did put a counter on the pause flow and try it two times or three times and then mm -hmm. um, let it go and let the morning job do the thing uh, kind of thing. That's what we put in. But I just wanted to be to know what the proper procedure for this is in your basically saying discourage doing either one delay or pause as much as you can right yeah correct i i would avoid the use of the these steps okay uh it feels strange to me to use either of these steps in my design in a flow okay there's um so yeah Hopefully that helps. Okay, yeah, that helps. Thank you. Okay, yeah, you bet. All right, anybody else got any questions for us? All right. 
All right, thanks everybody. Go ahead and call it a day. We will talk to you same time tomorrow. Have a great afternoon.